Hi folks, uh, welcome to this uh, webcast, uh, which is a part of MHPN's online conference, Working Better Together. My name's Chris Dolman, I'm from Emerging Minds, the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health, and yeah, I'd like to welcome you to this webcast uh, today. Um, we're presenting a, a stream within this conference um, called uh, Around Trauma and uh, the Impact of Adverse Childhood Experiences. So uh, yeah, welcome to those uh, uh, both viewing this uh, right now, as well as uh, people that are uh, watching this uh, down the track. Welcome. Um, yeah, before we go further, I'd like to um, acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land on which uh, we've gathered today, as well as uh, where you are, and um, pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and of course acknowledge the ongoing connection that the traditional owners of the lands uh, have um, in, in so many ways. So um, I'd also like to um, uh, welcome uh, our panel today. So uh, welcome to Sarah. Thank you. Welcome to Jackie. And yeah, welcome to you as well, Ben. We're really uh, delighted to be um, gathering here to um, really talk about some um, very mm. uh, challenging and pertinent mm. and uh, interesting uh, practice challenges that um, yeah, practitioners face when working with uh, families um, in relation to adversity and in relation to the effects of adversity on child mental health. So um, I'd also like to um, introduce you to uh, some of the uh, learning outcomes, just remind you of those. Um, so uh, at the conclusion of today's uh, webinar, we're hoping to have contributed to your understanding of the challenges faced by uh, practitioners facing adversity, uh, you know, when they do present at services and, you know, what worries them and how can um, practitioners respond to these worries and, and concerns. We're also hoping to uh, explore uh, some of the professional practices uh, that can support parent-child relationships uh, as they overcome adversity and also explore how practitioners can uh, support parents through adversity whilst um, still enabling parents to maintain a focus on their children's uh, social and emotional uh, well-being. So, um, this uh, webinar will be focusing around uh, four um, common practice challenges. Um, we'll be looking at uh, around how practitioners can have conversations with parents when practitioners hold concerns about the safety and well-being of children, um, how practitioners can respond to parents who may be holding negative or ambivalent mm. views about their children as well. Um, and also, you know, how practitioners can work with families facing multiple uh, adversities, um, perhaps seemingly overwhelming adversities, how they can do that in a way that also helps parents to hold on to uh, hope and, um, and uh, be mindful of children's experience uh, in all of that. And also, yeah, how um, practitioners can help parents focus on the social and emotional well-being of children um, in ways that aren't uh, stigmatising uh, for parents as well. So there's some of the themes that we mm. hope to uh, hope to get to uh, mm -hmm. today. Um, so yeah, this webcast is actually uh, the second that we're offering today. Um, we had one uh, a couple of hours ago around lunchtime where we had a panel of um, panel of parents mm. uh, giving their uh, sharing their know-how, mm. giving their insights and perspectives around these challenges. And I know that Ben and Jackie and Sarah mm. were uh, viewing that and. Um, really drawn to some of the particular uh, sentiments and um, perspectives of parents. So um, uh, looking forward to hearing a bit about that uh, from each of you as well. So um, there are a few kind of uh, logistical things I'd just like to go through with you. Firstly, that um, you know, we'd really value uh, your contribution to our conversation in terms of um, uh, you know, if you're interested in submitting a question, uh, you're really welcome to do that. There's a um, tab on the bottom right hand corner of your screen, so please send those through. We also have um, uh, some supporting resources through the Emerging Minds Resource Library tab, which is also on the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're having trouble with uh, technical matters, there's a Frequently Asked Questions tab at the top of the screen. And um, uh, if, yeah, just a reminder to um, uh, click on the uh, full screen view. That'll kind of um, make all of this work a lot better in terms of from where you're sitting. So you yeah, would encourage you to, to do that as well. 
Um, there's also a, um, at the end of today, um, we'd really like to invite you to complete a, um, like an exit survey, a feedback form, which ultimately, I guess, helps us get better at what we do, and so we'd really value your contribution there. And that tab's at the top of the screen, so I hope I've covered off on all those tabs that are on your screen, um, but uh, yeah, please um, certainly um, make, use of, make use of those. So um, I think they're the main things that um, <laughs> we need to need to set the scene for. Have I forgotten anything? That's probably it. Yeah, great. So um, uh, let's um, let's take a you know a, a closer look now at uh, that first practice challenge. And, and all of these, as you know, were you know haven't come out of thin air. No. They've come from practitioners that have um, you know viewed webinars that we've off offered previously with MHPN as well as, um, you know, from our consultations with uh, services um, at Emerging Minds. Um, and so they're pretty, pretty pertinent and, I guess, uh, pretty critical, I think, um, when we consider uh, children's overall well-being. Um, so the first challenge that we're hoping to sort of um, uh, speak a bit about is um, a question, you know, how can practitioners have conversations with parents about child protection concerns without shaming and silencing and uh, alienating them. And actually I said to the parents that we met with earlier a bit about how I appreciate this question because it kind of signals both a, con you know, a couple of concerns that practitioners have, doesn't it? A concern mm. to not, um, not shame or silence or not mm. alienate parents, mm -hmm. but also a concern to respond to perhaps concerns they might have in relation to children's safety and wellbeing. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, yeah, Ben, Sarah, Jackie, yep. whether, you know, in terms of um, even, you know, from what the parents spoke about earlier, I know you were taking notes and paying mm. attention to what they said, you know, what kind of stood out to you from what they said, mm. from what, you know, from what um, uh, Colleen and Emmy and John spoke about earlier in terms of what's important from a parent's perspective that practitioners mm. do, what stood out? Um, I think we were talking and we were talking about... Um something that really stood out was that quote of silence and shame. There was already silence and shame that's there. Mm. And um, mm. <clears throat> if we don't kind of have that conversation, we add to the shame because the parents already know that it's there. Okay, okay. And um, often if we don't talk about it, the parents know what's going on in their life. They're the experts in their life. Mm. And if we don't have that conversation around um, the child protection concerns, we're, we're, it's almost like the elephant in the room that no one wants to pay attention to and we're not going to ask about it because, mm. you know, and, and, and like I said, they're the experts, they know why we're there. Mm. And if we just don't have the, delve into that conversation or actually just be honest about that conversation, mm. we take a bit of power mm -hmm. away from the family by mm. not having that conversation. I guess that's what I was interested in when you mm. said, like, it's the elephant in the room. What's the effect of just of it remaining the elephant yep. in the room on families? Mm. Like, well, what, would you, what, what would you say from your perspective has been, could be the effect mm. of just it remaining the elephant in the room? Well, I guess if, if something as important as the welfare of a parent's child is on their mind, right. and they're then not sure if it's on your mind, mm. Um, they're going to start questioning us. Okay. Why haven't we got the courage to face something with them? Uh -huh. um, but I think they're going to wonder whether we're questioning them. Yep. You know, okay. Are we yep. thinking that they somehow haven't got the wherewithal to hear difficult information? Yep. Mm. Um, it, mm. I think it feeds into some kind of amongst other things, some kind of power imbalance yeah. okay. where we're either assuming that they're simply not able to hear stuff and that adds to the shame, yes. mm -hmm. right. or that somehow we know best mm -hmm. about what we should talk about and what we shouldn't talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. it's their child's right, right. well-being mm -hmm. that's at stake mm -hmm. and parents want the best for their children. Yes, yeah. I think mm -hmm. it was John that mentioned the importance of the practitioner being in the corner yep. together. Okay, yeah. Well, what did that metaphor bring mm. to mind for you, uh, Ben? Yeah, I think that the, the big piece around the connection that you mm. have in the relationship, and I think the foundation of that connection is really the trust. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. So trust comes, you know, being a consistent person, a practitioner in their mm. life perhaps, but also just through open, clear, transparent conversations. Mm. Mm. Yep. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and you have to take in um, people's lived experience. 
So okay. when we talk about um, the families know what's going on in their life, they've also had their own story. Mm -hmm. And we just assume that people know what is best for their child or, or they know what child protection issues are. If you've had, um, especially when we're talking of intergenerational trauma, um, and we've had um, in, in, in a cultural context for this country where we've had um, people that have been stolen generation and through um, generational of being removed yes. and not parented, how do, you, mm -hmm. how do you know to parent if you haven't been parented? Mm -hmm. And so you're doing the best you can with the skills you've got. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people are thinking that they are doing great parenting without realising that that's not okay to be doing or people are looking at that as that's not okay to be parenting like that. Okay. But their lived experience is, well, that's, that's my lived experience and that's what I've known to be okay. And mm. if no one doesn't tell me anything else, mm. I'm thinking that's okay. And for us then what happens is um, someone knocks on the door and takes your children away uh. without that conversation of what I was doing was wrong. Well, so that power automatically gets taken away because um, people are scared to have that conversation around child protection. Okay. and. <clears throat> What we've, in, in the work that we've done in, in, in the, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, yeah. a lot of the parents are telling us, no one told us that there were these concerns mm. until they knocked on the door and took okay. our kids. Okay. And how was that for those families? Like well, what? Of course, that's, it's, it's really hurtful because like we had all these services in here and we thought we were doing great and we've got, I'm engaging with this service and I'm engaging with this service, but no one actually told us that they were going back and putting reports in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah. where is the choice and control in that? Right, okay. It's for families, so yeah. families need choice and control and being able to have an honest conversation with families or, or with parents around, actually, what I'm seeing here, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to go back and put a report in, mm -hmm. um, but what can we do yeah. to, to help with that? Because with that, you know, we're gonna have to put a report in, but what are some of the, the goals and where are some of the achievements that we're going to um, work towards? Okay. So when I put that report in, I can actually say, actually, but what we're going to be doing mm. is this is what we're gonna be working with with the parents. Mm. Mm. But if we don't have that conversation, we just go and put the report in, mm. again, there's okay. a lack of trust. Yeah. So the reporting in, so to speak, yep. has to be accompanied by something? You That's think? right. Yeah. Yep. And, and so what would you call it, that it needs to be accompanied by? So what is it that we're going to do? So right, what, right. What, what is the therapeutic intervention that's right, going to happen right. yeah. with yeah. that? Mm -hmm. yeah. A point in that, I think, is this, this word authenticity that yeah. I know um, John, Emmy and Colleen all mentioned, which I think as a practitioner it's important we bring that authenticity mm -hmm. and having clear, open, um, tough conversations is yep. part of that. Um, yep. And so I think in, you know, talking about some of these really tricky areas, I think um, you know, really working on the foundational pieces of that, which is building connection, mm -hmm. you know, listening with acceptance, without yep. judgment, bringing a curious lens to mm -hmm. that exploration and really kind of meeting some mm -hmm. of that um, shame with, with empathy, which mm -hmm. is really the heart of connection. Mm -hmm. So yep. I think it's a balancing act for a practitioner, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think authenticity mm -hmm. yep. was a word that stood out for yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and vulnerability. Yeah. There's, there's something in um, having those honest conversations when you're a practitioner, when you're kind of going, actually, it's okay for me to be vulnerable too. Mm. So I'm going to have this hard conversation with you and that puts me in a vulnerable position, but then we can share that, that space of vulnerability. Mm. Whereas if, if I'm always going to come in mm. without some mm. vulnerability or, or actually I'm the expert or I'm, I'm the person in charge, then you don't sit in that space together. Yeah, I can so, sense that feeling as a practitioner, that yep. vulnerable. Like, what do you think are the steps that help to create, I guess? Yep steps forward around that vulnerability if you're not having those conversations? That, well, that takes a lot of self-reflecting as a practitioner because mm. we often ask our families or our, or our mothers and fathers to do a lot of self-reflecting. Mm. Then we have to do that as practitioners ourselves. Mm. So where's our self-reflecting in this? Like, what am I adding to this? Am I adding something um, that's useful? Mm. Or am I adding to the shame? Mm. You know, because. That, that is where our vulnerability comes in. in if we don't self-reflect, what are we doing to help this, to, to be able to assist the family mm. if we can't sit somewhere vulnerable? Because mm. um, that's something that um, in my culture is, is something we do quite well. So um, mm. we had only Miriam Rose from Daily River that gave the gift of Diddy. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call heart-based heart listening, that real listening um, to the story 
with vulnerability and empathy and being able to self-reflect of what mm. belongs to me in this story and what belongs to the client and then being able to go, oh, actually, does that belong to the family or is that my belief that's coming through yeah. in that story? And being able to be able to have be self-reflective enough to be able to keep your mm. um, biases and values and beliefs there and keeping the, the family story here. Mm. Mm. Um, in addition to some of the things you said, are there other things do you feel that need to kind of precede those um, upfront, authentic, vulnerable kind of conversations? Mm. You know, other 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 things that need to precede those in the conversations with parents at all? You know, or what, like I'm just wondering what might mm. also need to accompany that mm. or come before that. There's even like I guess the environmental factors. Um, okay. You know, from my OT lens, mm -hmm. which I don't know about you guys, Jackie and Sarah, mm. if there's consideration around stepping into an environment, a clinic environment, and how you can make any changes to that to, mm -hmm. to help mm -hmm. a level of comfort, of safety, yep. internal sense of safety for the parent. Yep. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think, mm. like, from one of the things that I think is really important that we mm. pay attention to that fits in with what you're saying mm. is, actually, where do I sit internally with regards to the family I'm with, can mm. I hold a genuine position of mm. care? Okay. Do I genuinely embrace the belief that children need to be with their parents where possible? You know, do I genuinely understand that parents want to be good parents, that children want to have good relationships with their parents and that that is a fundamental desire for families? Yeah. And, and I think one of the things I think a lot about is, yeah. am I holding that position genuinely oh. and it, do I hold it right through to my core? Because mm. if I don't, mm. then I'm going to transmit something yep. mixed or unclear yeah. oh. in, yep. in everything that I do. Yeah. So oh. I yeah. think okay. yeah. um, from, from my perspective as a practitioner, yep. there's paying mm. attention to the external environment yep. and there's paying attention to my internal, internal. environment. Mm -hmm. is there some, this mm. is probably a tricky question. Is there something that you might notice about your practice that would confirm for you you're holding that position? Or even something that might alert you that you've, you've drifted a bit from that, you know, when you're doing the work with, with families? I guess that's a question for all of us, really. But I'm wondering, yeah, what can alert us to that holding what you're describing or, you know, letting it slip a bit, I guess. Mm. Um, um, yeah. Uh, one of the things that I do is I monitor my physical state okay. a lot. Okay. Yeah. So yep. I've, I've got a, a road map that I suppose I've developed over a number of years where I can feel physically different depending which state I'm in or whether okay. I'm drifting. I so if I'm, mm. so I pay a lot of attention to body sensation okay. yeah. and I've mm. learned to associate certain sensations with being open, but it often comes with a sense of being energised even in the face of really complicated conversations. Mm. Okay, okay. Feeling kind of often quite moved by uh -huh. conversations. Uh -huh. yeah. And for me, often feeling somewhat in awe of what a family I'm sitting with is yep. managing, yep. then I know that I'm probably sitting in the place I want to be mm. in. Mm. And when those things start to go missing, then I need to, I think mm. like you're saying, self-reflect and wonder yep. why mm. has that pushed me into something that's yeah. fragile or difficult for me? Mm. Or, you know, yeah. why have I drifted? Mm. Um, it's usually fear for mm. me. Mm. I don't know what it mm. is for other people. Mm. It's interesting to also think about what, organize, what agencies or organisations can do to support practitioners to hold the kind yep. of space that you're proposing, I think, yep. you know, rather than just individualising it as to a pass or fail for practitioners yep. to yep. do that in mm. a way. What yep. organisations um, or agencies mm. that you might have some familiarity with that can do mm. to support yeah. practitioners to, um, to take care around all of that? Mm. Um, <clears throat> so, so for me, it's a what I find is it's in the relationship that I have with the family. Okay. So, um, are we connecting? Mm -hmm. Is is the, uh, are we having an honest um, mm. dialogue? Uh, do I feel like there's authenticity in the room from myself? Do the, you know, it, it's about relationship mm -hmm. and um, mm. and connection. 
Mm. So we we got to have relationship and connection with our with with the family that we're working with, and so I say connect at every level, like connect, connect, connect wherever we can connect, um, and and ego take ego out. What do you mean? Take so ego out. so ego comes with when you have these hard conversations, mm -hmm. people are going to get upset. These are their children. Mm -hmm. So when I'm having a conversation saying, look, this this is bordering on child protection, I expect them to get upset. Okay. Do you know, but of mm -hmm. course, and if they didn't get upset, well, you know, because right. I'm going to now tell them that I'm going to go and put it. So for them to get upset, and and I might get a mouthful. Yeah. And that's okay. Okay. Because that's not an attack on me. Do you know, like if I start going, oh, that you know, this fam, mm -hmm. actually, it's not, it's not attack on me. This is this family, and to me, it actually shows strength. Because mm -hmm. what I'm saying is, actually, if, if they're getting upset, this shows that they have this real care for their mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. So if I brought my ego into that and went how mm. dare they attack mm. me, mm. Mm. then, mm. you know, mm. I've, I've lost. Yeah. So that has you interpreting their response in a particular right. helpful yep. way for you? Yeah. Yep. What does that enable, make more possible in your practice to see their response in yep. that way, do you think? Well, because it, it, to me it shows that they have that, um, well, you know, I, I'd call it, um, I, I'd want to see a reaction. Right. Mm. And if I didn't, um, and, and, and it also creates rupture and pair. Okay. So rupture and repair happens in all relationships. Mm. So if we think that that's not going to happen in a client practitioner relationship, okay. you know, we just think, oh, we're just going to go along this fine and dandy without some mm. kind of uh, rupture happening. Well, then we're kind of kidding ourselves, okay. aren't we? So, you know, of course, there's going to be something that comes up that upsets the relationship, but it's mm. in the repair. Mm. And if we're going to be um, talking to parents about their children and how they rupture and repair their mm. relationships, mm. then we've got to demonstrate that in the relationship that we have with our clients. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I wonder whether mm. some, some of what you're saying is also quite relevant for the next practice challenge that we were mm. hoping to kind of get onto a bit, which was, mm -hmm. um, you know, how can practitioners respond to parents who hold uh, negative or ambivalent opinions about their children, um, you know, that could um, be adversely affecting the child's well-being? Um, yeah, and again, this reflects, I guess, a concern for practitioners because um, we know, don't we, from our own practice that uh, sometimes we hear these sentiments mm. uh, from parents that are very diminishing or degrading, I guess, of kids mm. at times. Mm. And so this can pose some dilemmas. Mm. <laughs> what to do about this, how, mm. how to respond. Um, again, you know, Emmy and John and Colleen spoke mm. a bit about some of that. Were there particular things that caught your attention from what they said that kind of then linked into some of your mm. own understandings or knowledge about this? Yeah, yeah I know that they talked about um, building off the strengths, their own kind of individual strengths as parents. Okay. Mm. Um, and I think that's a really important place for us to start as practitioners, you know, it's, you can get lost in uh, the assessment tool you're using or right. the certain organisational processes that you need to be mm. kind of ticking off. Mm -hmm. And I think if you just meet the parent where they are with, mm -hmm. with their own strengths, um, one activity I like to do, particularly with kids and parents, yeah. is, um, you know, play and, and, you know, play being a primary occupation for kids. But in that, you have these conversations where you get the child to reflect on their own strengths. Um, and often some of the, their favourite activities they talk about is spending time with their parents. Oh. Mm. I think that kind of shift in perspective mm. is really important um, and helps the parent to start seeing, you know, I guess positive interactions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I know Colleen talked about that a lot. and. Uh, can be tricky seeing some of those positive interactions with our kids so um, at times so just kind of helping to reshift that lens towards mm. things that are already kind of um, doing really well together is important mm. um, yeah right. so mm. I'm not sure what you guys think around that mm. But. Mm. I think um, there was something um, that I think John said about how difficult it is to find yourself feeling negative about your children and he used the example of resentment. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of like, who can you talk to about mm. feeling resentful towards your child? And I guess one of the things that that really brought to mind for me and something that I do a lot is to think about what must it like, be like for a parent who probably set out mm. to experience a joyful relationship with their child mm. to find themselves feeling so entrapped in a kind of negative space and feeling compelled to say these things to their children that I'm sure are not part of the plan, not yeah. part of what someone wanted. Mm. So mm. 
Um, I think that it's actually quite important to have some empathy for the parent about how awful it is to find yourself feeling negative towards your child mm. and make some space for that conversation. Okay, okay. Um, yep. And the other thing that, that was in there was about the story. What's the story behind mm -hmm. why this parenting experience has become so difficult mm -hmm. at this time? Mm -hmm. What's that related to? Is there something traumatic mm -hmm. in the background mm -hmm. that if we understood it better, we could bring that compassion and understanding together to bear on right. that negativity. Mm. So, mm. Yeah, that's mm. something else yeah. that I, I was yeah. really interested in. Yeah. Mm. Could I ask you about when you said about, um, Jackie, about making space for that, you know, for the parent to speak about uh, their view of the, their child, you know, and these experiences of resentment or whatever, you know. Um, how do, how, do you, how do you kind of make that space so they're particular, and again a question mm. for all of us, how do, how do we make that space for parents to speak into that? Is it, um, are there particular inquiries or other things that are said that kind of enable that space to be created, do you think? Yeah. I, I'm, quite, um, I'm quite over in making some guesses if I think okay. something mm. like that is happening for a parent and it's really hard for that parent to speak about that, then mm -hmm. I might make some guesses or mm -hmm. offer some thoughts about uh, what they might be experiencing, just okay. as an invitational. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, mm. starting a conversation, an invitation that this is something we can do here. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I was, I was interested how you use that language around making guesses or offering thoughts. Like, is mm. that that, um, that suggests a particular positioning, I guess, of your own views around that? Is that um, linked to other things you think that are important in working with parents um, at that time? Yeah, Yeah. look, I, I think one of the other things that came through for me was this power imbalance mm. and um, the idea of the practitioner as the expert. Mm. And I like to move a long way from that and think of myself as having some expertise yeah. in child development or trauma yes. or... Mm or whatever it is, but that I bring some expertise to the table which mm -hmm. I can hopefully marry with the expertise that the child brings and the parent yeah. mm. brings, and together we we might mm. be able to understand something, mm. Mm. Um, yeah. but really want to move a long way from that idea of practitioner as expert. Right. Mm. Yeah. You know, we just have expertise. Mm. I think normalising, mm. okay. yeah. that, that actually we're not going to love our child every part mm. of the day mm. Mm. when, you know, sometimes it's, it's actually quite normal mm -hmm. to feel mm. some kind of angst or resentment about child. Like, you know, this is not, you're not the only person that has this, these thoughts running through your head. So normalising yes. and saying, actually, it's okay with, with the, maybe the circumstances that you're in mm -hmm. or with mm -hmm. what's happened in your life. Mm -hmm. um, of course, this may be where you're up to at the moment, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that we're going to be here forever. Right. Mm -hmm. Like to give some, some clear goals at this, at right now we might be here, but mm -hmm. there might, you know, we, we can create change. Mm -hmm. And something that came up in that last conversation was that emotional literacy mm -hmm. was not everyone has had the, um, the experiences in life to be able to name how they're feeling. Okay. Um, so that emotional literacy is, is a really something that we work on a lot with our parents mm -hmm. and um, caregiving sensitivity, we call it. So, what what so do you call it, sorry? Caregiving sensitivity. Okay. So in, like, in, in simple conversations, because they don't need to be um, big therapeutic sessions, but in simple conversations of, of being able to um, get the parent to see the child as their own individual with their own individual right. personality mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. characteristics. So, yeah, you know, like, yeah. oh, did you see the way, the, if it was a baby, did you see the, oh, baby just, you know, your baby just mm. looked at you when you talked. Did you see the way baby actually um, followed your, your, you with mm. the gaze of the eyes? Mm. So it kind of puts the child back into the, into the parent's mind of, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, actually I did notice that. Or actually I noticed every time, um, mm. you know, Johnny does that, you, you give him a bit of a, high five or you, you smile at him you know so really work on what's already there that you're seeing so be really um, observant of what you're looking at mm -hmm. and counter that with so you know as much as you might be feeling some resentment 
there's all these mm. other things that you're doing as well that are really good and, mm. and really positive because mm. often we focus on what's not and, and that's just society in a general. Mm -hmm. So parents are so weighed down of how I should be behaving, but there's all this other stuff that you're doing that's really good as well okay. and, and concentrate more on that than the actual negative and, and give the, the emotional literacy yeah. and because people don't know, you know, anger, we're either angry or we're sad mm, right. and there's all these things that are in between that, that mm. a lot of people don't know how to name. Yeah, but yeah. angry and sad are the most available kind of descriptions that's to people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, just building on that, I think um, sometimes giving skills or education can be really helpful yep. um, and what I find um, talking about, I mean, looking at behaviour and often, you know, we can kind of zoom in on behaviour and not be looking at what's under the surface. Yep. And I, I think often when we provide some education to parents, um, OTs talk a lot about regulation. Mm. Um, and so we start breaking this down around what's impacting the body, the emotions, the environment. Yep. But interwoven in that is this idea of co-regulation. You know, yep. what, what we feel, our kids feel, yep. is this idea of attachment, um, is this idea of relationships and the yep. importance of relationships. And, you know, I think at times that, that kind of information is really helpful. And, you know, building in certain phrases yeah. or concepts, you know, circle of security was talked about, mm. um, you know, the hands on the circle and returning back when that cup's empty. Mm. And these are mm. things that really make sense to parents. And yep. I know I worked with a dad recently um, and we did uh, use Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain yep. to help him understand about his child flipping the lid mm. and he said, oh gosh, that's what happens to me when I get home every mm. day. And mm. yep. so I think that information can be really helpful. Um, yeah, in, in changing perspectives, particularly um, when we're focused in on behaviour. Mm -hmm. So I think skills yep. and building yeah, that definitely. education can yep. be helpful. So we call it like educare. Educare, mm. okay. So, you know, you're, you're, you're giving the, edu like the, the information, but in a caring way, mm -hmm. because you're actually educating to care. Do you know, so we use the, that flipping the lid yeah. a lot and, and it's so easy and parents get it so often we think that um, you know, knowledge is to be shared so in, in mm. our culture when we when we, we get knowledge knowledge is to be shared mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yet we somehow try to keep knowledge actually or think that parents aren't in the right space to hear this kind of knowledge if it helps them understand where their children are coming from. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. often the child's the sacrificial lamb. You know, we're coming here because the child's behaviour is mm -hmm. is out of control. Mm -hmm. But often when you start working with that, self-reflection comes in. Do you know, because you start going, because we've done that with, you know, at the moment what's happening is he's in his lizard brain because we use the lizard brain. And then the dad turned around and said, is that why I act like the way I do? Mm -hmm. So, you know, then that mm -hmm. comes in and then it changes the conversation. But, and so giving that educare okay. often mm. leads to self-reflection, mm -hmm. um, but it's easier to talk about the children than it is, especially when you've got so much trauma in your life. So if, if you've got a lot of trauma and um, it's easier to talk about the children than talk about yourself. And then as you start working with the children, their story comes through and they, there's this trust that builds because actually I'll, I'll trust you first with the kids yeah. and then I'll see how you go mm. there and then I'll be able to trust you with my story. Yeah, okay. So it's creating that right, safety. Right. Oh, okay, I can see where, mm -hmm. where that's going mm -hmm. and now I trust you. Yeah. And that can open up conversations not just around the children but around the, I guess, the parents' that's relationship to the children, their parenting right. of the children yep. as well. Yeah. And um, yep. Yep. can uh, help parents, I guess, step into other aspects yep. of that that perhaps are harder to talk about maybe. Yeah, mm. yep. yeah. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yep. Thank mm. you. The other thing we do is use tools. So um, I don't know if anyone's heard the three houses. We use the three houses, okay. which kind of gets the parents to think of what it is that they hope. What's their house of hopes? Like, what is it that they hope for their family, okay. for their parent, like for their parenting, mm -hmm. um, their dreams? Um, we talk about the foundation of that. What 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 are the things that could cause cracks in that? Mm -hmm. Mm. Do you know, so some of those the issues, so that's where we can then start having conversations around substance abuse, mm. um, you know, DV, because okay. actually they might be the things that might be able to add to those. So that's where that conversation of bringing DV, yeah. substance abuse comes in. And those things are brought in the context of a conversation about hopes, though, sort that's of right. dreams or whatever. Exactly. That's strength right. based. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Actually, I'm wondering whether um, some of what you're saying, uh, all saying there, might also again link in with a, a further challenge that has come up um, mm -hmm. uh, from practitioners, and that is a bit about, um, you know, how can practitioners support parents that are facing um, uh, immediate and multiple and uh, sometimes overwhelming adversities? Mm -hmm. um, 
So parents who are facing those adversities, how can practitioners support them to maintain hope and um, a positive and mindful perspectives around children? Mm. So, yeah, again, was there something from um, what the parents said earlier that kind of stood out to you mm. about that, that um, had you thinking about other things mm. that you know from your own practice? Mm. For it's that overwhelming, you know, the, um, there's so much going on. Mm. And when we get problems saturated, mm -hmm. all the problems get really, really, so everything becomes that problematic that actually it's better that I just don't do nothing mm -hmm. because it's all so heavy. So just helping um, navigate the problems, like what is it that, you know, mm -hmm. we call it a lot like bag of worries, what's the biggest worry right now? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what can we stick in that bag? So what are the, the three right. biggest worries in your life right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we'll work with those three worries because otherwise you can get drawn into there's all of this stuff really narrowing it down to actually what are the three biggest things that are going on for you mm -hmm. and then being able to work on those and scaffold because often what we do is um, with clients that are in crisis um, mm. oh we'll put a referral here and we'll put a referral there and then we've got 10 services and it becomes overwhelming so yeah. scaffold around the, um, the the service or the therapeutic service that you're offering around if this is the biggest problem right now if drug and alcohol is the biggest problem right now Mm -hmm. then let's concentrate on drug and alcohol. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if child protection is the biggest concern right now, let's concentrate on child protection. Mm -hmm. and, so and what do you think that enables um, for parents to sort of do that, um, you know, focusing on the biggest worry or the bag of worries? Yeah, because it makes them available for that particular problem. So right. actually right now I can concentrate on this and mm -hmm. I know I've got a clear idea of what I need to do mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, instead of going feeling like I'm being pulled in five different or six different directions. Actually, mm -hmm. yep, this is what I'm working on. Um, I've got a, a plan and I've got a goal and this is where I'm heading. Mm -hmm. Yep, so it gives them a direction and helps them navigate. Because, mm -hmm. you know, um, if you make the plan, if a family makes the plan, if the family mm -hmm. say, this is what I want to work on, then they're going to, it, it's a lot more than if I say, actually, this is what you need to work on. Yeah, right. Like actually find out what does the family want to work on? Like what does the family think their biggest mm -hmm. need is at the mm -hmm. moment? Because often we go in with our own agenda. It's like actually, mm -hmm. let's find out what the family's agenda is yeah. and what it is that they think is going on for them mm -hmm. because that's most likely the problem. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, and yeah. Jackie, there are some things that were resonating uh, for you and what Sarah just mm -hmm. s said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of the things that I was um, thinking about was the previous panel talked a lot about breaking things down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think there's that sense of how do you think together to kind of break things down into manageable pieces yeah, okay. and find things you can get an early win with. Mm. Okay, get um, an early win. Yeah. You know, just something that you might be able to make a real difference mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. one of the things that um, I quite enjoy about my current workplace is yeah. that we, we bring therapeutic work and mm. practical case management together into one okay. service. You like that? Yeah. And I, what I really like about that is that we're not then stuck with either trying to operate from a therapeutic framework mm. or operating with practical support, but we can do both. Mm -hmm. And yep. if doing something practical is going to get you a little bit of space, you know, help mm. the family solve one problem. Mm -hmm. yep. mm then you might be able to take a next step. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And so that breaking, breaking things down uh, mm. description that was used from the mm. parents earlier, like um, you spoke a bit about doing that in a way that kind of mm. is together, is collaborative mm. with, with parents. Yeah. Um, mm. Are there some ways that you find the most helpful to do that, uh, Jackie, or others as well? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, do you... Um, Oh, um, I mean, I guess it's really about actually having a proper conversation mm. about mm -hmm. what is the family's situation, mm. what are their needs, what's their current story, mm -hmm. what are they, what are they struggling with? So mm. a lot like mm. you were saying. Um, but I think something we've spoken about in a in a lot of setting is also bringing that sort of observational capacity to look for the minute moments where the hope is still there or the connection yeah. is still there or the relationship is still mm -hmm. working. So mm -hmm. always looking mm -hmm. for the strengths that currently exist, mm -hmm. trying to um, use anything that is already there mm -hmm. and extend it rather than trying to impose mm -hmm. 
yeah. new things that come mm. from our own framework. I love that phrase, minute mm. moments, as though, mm. um, uh, why did you add minute to the moments kind mm. of description? What, what is it you're wanting us to understand by even adding that? Because I think our lives are made up of breaths. Mm. You know, they're made up of small things. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, it's a series of small moments yep. that come together to, to make a life. Okay. And if we can attend mm. to each of those moments as they come and go, we mm -hmm. can build something. Mm. Okay. So, yeah. if a, you know, if a mm. parent is doing one thing really well in the midst of all of the difficulty, then mm. they might be able to do that for a few more moments yeah. or add something to mm. that. Um, but uh, when you're problem saturated, you can't find those moments mm -hmm. easily yourself. It, yeah. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, it's that balance mm -hmm. of acknowledging mm -hmm. how difficult it is right now yeah. and not losing sight of the mm -hmm. strengths. Yeah, okay. giving, um, yeah, I really resonate with what Jackie was saying and giving parents permission and to just connect with their kids. Yep. Um, and I think John mentioned that in the last session. It's uh, just giving a framework to say five minutes a day, you know, being present, following the lead of your child in play, really delighting and sharing joy mm -hmm. can have really significant benefits on their social mm -hmm. emotional development. And when parents know that and have permission to do that, it's really quite powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's practical as well when there's such a busy, perhaps a chaotic environment um, around them at times and just having five minutes to connect. Um, I think other things that really help is this mm. idea of any social networks that are mm. around them that we can draw on as, as strengths. Mm. Um, and often we'll kind of set up a bit of an activity schedule with families that's mapping out the week, you know, a tile and grout. So, you know, here are the activities and what are the networks that are kind of holding you together in those. Yeah. Which can be hard yeah. for families when they're in that space to find that five minutes. So you, you might ask them and they're like, no, I didn't have the time. Or, mm. um, so we can either add to the chaos sometimes. <laughs> yes. As practitioners, we do add into the chaos because we say we don't come in with our own agenda, but a lot of the time we're driven by um, our own service, you know, KPIs that we have to hit or what mm. are. So I think for challenge for practitioners is to challenge the workplace and kind of go, actually, um, I've got an hour with this family. So in that hour, I can help you know, I can set up a, an activity or I can take the, the family, because we're resourced, we're mm -hmm. privileged. You know, mm -hmm. for some of us that work in some of these organisations, we have um, yeah. the resources of, a, of work cars. Um, so we can pick the family up and take them to the park and model what, what Joy and Delight looks yeah, like. So okay. actually, let's go to the park mm -hmm. and have a picnic. That is a therapeutic session. But we think that, you know, we start mm -hmm. to put something, make something really difficult when actually a therapeutic session when a, when a family is so under stress, mm -hmm. finding that half hour, 45 minutes to have a break and uh -huh. actually go, I can breathe and I can delight in my child today mm -hmm. in this 45 minutes that I have with this in this time, mm -hmm. that is therapeutic work. Uh, and, this, we forget, yeah. and we forget yeah. about that, like, you know, yeah. so, yeah, because yeah, we kind of go, oh, we have mm -hmm. to, to stick to certain rigid ways mm -hmm. of therapy. Sticking too is really, um, I know we talked about this yeah. previously, is um, I had a session with a family um, at the start of the year and there was a lot of, she was feeling quite overwhelmed and so we just started, got a piece of paper and I just started writing on the table and using her words, mm. so just writing out all the kind of things yep. happening and drawing on what Jackie was saying, we just started to prioritise those really key things and then writing out the steps and it, anyway at the end we had a really clear goal between the visits and it was often about three months until I was yep. going to see them again. So I said I'll, I'll send you an email with the information um, and she's like, no, do you mind if I take that piece of paper with me? Mm. And, and I said, absolutely. And so put it into a bag. And so I went off and wrote my, my report, you know, spent yep. an hour and a half. And, you know, it was the, the kind of words in the report. And next time I saw her, I said, oh, how was, how was everything? And how was the report? Um, and she said, oh, to be honest, I didn't read it. I've, I've still got the piece of paper here and I use yep. that. And, <laughs> and so for yep. me, that was her own words. Yep. You know, that was really, I was just writing out the key things that she was saying to me and helping her to work through yep. that. And I think that. That in itself is it's hard to hold on to as a practitioner yep. when there is obligations, mm. but if yeah. we can hold that, that mm. voice of the family is at the yep. heart of what we do, it's important. Yeah. Yep. So we've taken um, families um, because resource poor. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, sometimes these families are resource poor. They're just living 
day to day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes we have to be really careful about what we're setting up to make sure that families don't fail. Was in, um, you know, oh, maybe if you can take kids down to the park or, um, or take the kids somewhere. And then you've got no bus tickets, you've got no car, you got no, so think about some of the families that are coming in or, or read, you know, an, a common um, thing that people do is, oh, you know, if you read a story to your child, let's remember that some people in this country, English is their third language. Yes. Even though we're, we're um, the First Nations people, English is, is a foreign language to this country. Mm. So sometimes saying, oh, and, and we were denied education. Yes. So saying to a family, oh, read a book to your child is something that might happen in the, in the Western culture. But if you put a culture content on it, that's not something that's an everyday occurrence. Telling a story verbally is how we yeah, how we okay. tell stories. We do it through a verbal or uh, through a, through art. Mm -hmm. So thinking outside that um, European cultural lens okay. too yeah. is really important mm -hmm. when we work with First Nations or when we work with culture diverse, because mm -hmm. we often stick a European lens on top of everything, mm -hmm. and we have to remember it doesn't always work that way no, for yeah. certain families. Yeah. Um, so we've done things where supply some art materials. Right, yeah. And the family come back with their own mm. portrait of what their family might look like. Or um, one um, thing we do a lot is, I don't know when it became policy that transporting clients um, enables them or creates dependency. Um, when you've got families that are in the brisk of DCP or Department of Child Protection, um, there is a lot of... Uh, they have to do so much. You, you got to go to yeah. this parenting course. You got to go to drug and alcohol. So trying to find a little bit of time to fit in a therapeutic service can be really hard. Yes. But you can have forty-five minutes in a car ride, getting from one appointment to the other, and the conversation that comes out of that is quite can be quite therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And you and you get a lot in that in that yes. conversation because there's something in the car even. Yeah. But people mm. going, oh no, that's that's enabling. So you know, mm. finding your time mm. and not adding extra stress to the parent that's already stressed out, because yeah. there's so many demands already on them. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I was thinking some of um, what you were saying as well, Sarah, it links in with um, a question in relation to um, uh, families who perhaps have good reason not to trust the systems mm. that the practitioner is representing. This is a mm -hmm. question from May. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so the family's got good reason not to trust the system the practitioner is representing, yeah. um, uh, maybe due to their own past or, um, yes. you know, cultural inappropriateness, yep. you know, the dominant yep. culture kind of affecting families and communities in unhelpful ways. So um, uh, this question in relation to steps that we can take when families are having difficulties connecting mm. with each other um, yep. and are being yep. responded to by those service systems. Yep. So again, not uh, yep. a question to all of us in yep. relation to that. You know, how, what steps can we take when the family is not responding, uh, having difficulties with each other, you know? Um, difficulties with each other or with the service? Having difficulties with each other but, seek, but are being um, also responded to by a system they don't trust, yep. for example, yep. as well. So yep. you'd, uh, you have some responses to that yep. <laughs> question. Um, mm. I always talk about, because um, that shame comes back in again. Mm -hmm. um, and shame, if, if we look at what shame does, shame either attacks self or mm -hmm. attacks others mm -hmm. or it actually um, makes us withdraw. Mm -hmm. and. Often people think, oh, they just don't want to engage. Mm. Actually, yeah, right. there's something in that not wanting to engage, and most of the time that's shame. Shame, okay. You know, and because who wants to go and tell people that actually um, the way we're living our lives is, is hurting our children? Mm. So, of course, there's a lot of shame in that. Yeah. So we're working with shame, and to understand that that's what we're working with. Um, and often we have policies that, you know, I go out, I ring up three times, they didn't answer, couldn't get contacts, so I just... I just didn't try again. So I take that back on. If there's not engagement, that's something you need to reflect on yourself. Mm -hmm. like as a practitioner, you need to do some self-reflection about what is it about the way that I'm coming across or, the, or, yes. the, or my skill that I'm the, the engagement isn't happening because it's not with the family. Mm. It's probably okay. with the way you're presenting or coming across. So it, that takes a good reflection on mm. well, what's going on mm. with me that mm. maybe I'm, I'm actually closing the door Mm. for mm. this family to come mm. out and engage. Mm. Mm. 
What about for others around working with families who are having dis difficulties uh, connecting with each other mm. um, and perhaps being responded to by services that they find difficult to trust because of good reasons in the past? Are there other ideas mm. or thoughts there? Yeah. I, mean, I, I guess and this probably sounds quite simple, but I guess one of the things that it's useful to do in those situations is to actually mm. put that on the table. Yep. Okay. You know, not to pretend it's not there, but to I'm back to guessing again. Mm. I obviously do a lot of guessing, <laughs> but you know, if, if you're not clear yet um, what the barrier is, mm. trying to have a conversation about that, but mm. you may have information that allows you to make a, at least a sensible guess mm -hmm. mm. that you know, the service you represent represents something that is um, been traumatising in the past or mm. that is uncomfortable mm. or difficult. Mm. Um, mm. You know, that sense of at least acknowledging yep. that what you represent may not be um, in that person's eyes helpful. Yeah, right. And, yep. and how can we work with that barrier? Okay, mm. okay. You know, how can we take that barrier and think together about mm bridging that gap mm. or having mm. a different experience. Mm. And I think if, if we're able to be transparent, we can invite transparency around yep. if I'm being really annoying or inappropriate, mm. maybe we could try and find a way for you to let me know, mm. Mm. Um, which is not easy, the power imbalance. But, mm. you know, if we are transparent, that does invite transparency in return. Mm. Mm. It's really interesting what you've said there. Um, I guess in a way you're checking in, you know, mm. and using any of those non-verbal mm -hmm. um, cues to just to, to check in with. That's my understanding of what you're saying with the yeah. um, with the parent, just to say, hey, I'm noticing this at the moment. Yep. Is this kind of mm. how do we move forward with that, mm. or is that a thing for mm. starters? Mm. Um, yep. Think about some of the qualities that you have to remind yourself as a as a practitioner to to bring and probably touches on um, the idea of self-awareness, mm. um, particularly when you've had, you know, back-to-back -back sessions and in the, um, as we talked about, the obligations mm. as a service, as, an organ as a, a system that we have mm -hmm. to kind of meet. Um, but I often use some of Dan Hughes's stuff, which is around pace, um, helps remind mm. me of a framework to come into, okay. mm -hmm. to connect. And the pace is um, often working with kids around the P, which is playfulness, but the ACE element, um, acceptance, curiosity and empathy for me helps to reframe how I'm connecting okay. and empathy mm. being the key there in mm. that kind of, um, and, and authentically connecting in an empathetic way. Yep. So, but we have to be quite grounded mm. in ourselves to be able to, mm. yeah, to connect yep. in that. Yeah. And I think we've got to remember the history of this country a little bit too. We have had, um, for, for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait yes. Islander families, of course there's mistrust. Yes. The, and, and you're coming to represent, um, all of us come to represent a system that has been placed on top and taken away um, the way we parent naturally, you know, because the world views don't fit. I was talking mm -hmm. before about um, a lot of our um, Aboriginal parenting practices, uh, you know, we natural consequence. So we, we do have mm -hmm. a, a, a further, when we look at the circle, the circle is a lot large. We let our kids out a little bit more, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that's how we, um, we have parented for mm -hmm. 60,000 years, you know? Yes. So <clears throat> there's a system that's been placed on top of that that does a dis distrust. So kind of navigating that is by, um, you know, often people say, oh, I didn't ring. It's like, well, half the time, they haven't got credit on their phone, you know, because mm -hmm. we, we live in this place of privilege mm -hmm. a lot. And, we, and, we, and our world views are from, and when I was, and that gets people upset when you say privilege, but, you know, sometimes they haven't got credit on their phone mm -hmm. to be able to ring yeah, you back. Sure. So going out there mm -hmm. and just having a knock on the door is sometimes, you know, they might not answer the first time, then I'll go back again. Mm -hmm. And then they might just open the door a little bit and then I'll go back again and I'll have a conversation with them on the step. So it's how... Um, engaged are you going to be as a mm. practitioner? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because often we think, oh, well, if if they don't want to come along, they're just not interested. No, actually, these are the families that probably need the help the most, but are so scared in, in, in shame and fear and they need that little bit extra support. So, you know, we call it that high support, high mm -hmm. challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where that high, and often what we have is when we have high challenge, it seems that support goes, right. whereas that's when high support oh, is needed. Okay. Yeah. 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 Cool. And I 
I think you're talking a bit about the flexibility too yep. of actually, you know, therapy doesn't have to happen in a therapy room. That's right. <laughs> therapy can happen mm. in all sorts of different ways and different settings and mm. maybe it's not comfortable to come mm. to an organisational right. office but maybe it's okay to meet somewhere neutral yep. or go to a home. It, yep. It's again about what will work for the family, mm -hmm. yep. not what works for for us and yep. what's convenient for us mm. or fits mm. our world view or our yep. mm. yeah. um, yep. training. Mm. And we've only got, I'm a bit mindful of the time okay. and we haven't got so long to go, but um, I guess um, what, uh, what we've been talking about recently, I'd like to kind of link that into the final practice mm. challenge around how can practitioners help both, um, help parents both focus on the social and emotional wellbeing mm of children, um, uh, but not feel stigmatised by their experiences of adversity. Mm. So in amongst everything that's going on, I guess, you know, um, uh, parents can become very preoccupied <laughs> with all that they're mm. up against, mm. can't they? And I guess the well-being of children mm. can be mm. unintentionally um, uh, pushed to the side mm. a bit sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Like so, so I'm wondering, yeah, what how practitioners can respond mm. to that in a way that helps oh. parents keep the focus on children. Yeah. Yep. John said something really great in the last one about um, linking in parental like parental recovery with child well being. And I thought that was just a gem like, you know, so the parents' recovery is about the child's well being. Mm -hmm. um, so if the parents are, are, are getting the help and seeking the support and are on their way to their recovery, mm. of course that's linked to their children. So if we can get the parents in a good space mm. and get the parents' um, well-being going well, yeah. then that's going to have a trickle-on effect to the child's well-being. Yeah. And often we, we go, oh, um, we, we try to separate them. But there is a diet there, so it's parents, so it's a family dynamic, not we, we're just working with a child around their well-being. Actually, that child's well-being is very connected to the parent mm -hmm. or to, the, to whoever that mm. is parenting that child. So actually mm. both of them together yeah. and the healing foundation actually mm. said that um, for healing to happen in this country that it has to be do, done generational mm -hmm. so across generations okay. yeah. so you know mm. so if we're, if we're looking at um, creating well, great well-being for families mm -hmm. and strong spirit because we often mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. we talk about often our families have broken spirit because of what's happened mm -hmm. or, um, da or you know, damaged spirit. So we, we want to create strong spirit and that has to be done across generations. So parent, child, grandparents, um, it's going to try to solo all of the, everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, mm -hmm. I think something that's almost been perhaps present in this conversation but not stated explicitly till mm -hmm. now is that I think most of us work with parents and children okay. together. Yep. And one very powerful way to um, keep the child alive in the parent's mind is actually not just to see one or the other, but yeah, okay. to have both present and to have conversations about the challenges the family are facing, mm. not in ways that are going to burden children, but in ways that take mm. the burden off children, but create understanding. Mm. Mm. And, mm. you know, it, we collude with taking the parent's eyes off their child if yep. we don't bring the child that's into right. okay. the work. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And so I think, mm -hmm. I think that's something yep. you've just yep. really stated, yep. but um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's something that we mm -hmm. all do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to be advocates, so, you know, okay. we've mm -hmm. got families that are trying to um, navigate a very big system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden they're in this system that, and they're trying to navigate. So they do need someone in their corner and they do need someone that's going to help them navigate that system or actually go in and say, hey, stop, everyone just breathe. This family has this, you know, mm. and, and have that faith in the family. Often mm. we talk about being family focused, but are we family led? Mm -hmm. Do we have faith in the family? And we've got to show that faith in the family okay. by saying, actually, yeah, I believe they've got this. So I'm actually going to stay here and say to other services, I have faith in this family mm -hmm. and, and that, they're on their way to recovery, and mm. they've got this. Mm -hmm. yep. mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, there's been a, a couple of questions, and I haven't quite allowed enough time for them. But That's maybe right. you could say something a bit about. Um, there's been a couple of questions around the importance of um, supervision, and I know we spoke before mm. a bit about the role of agencies in supporting good practice. Mm. But um, yeah, I guess I wonder uh, about. Um, 
So there's a few questions. Maybe mm. there's a, maybe a, a theme amongst them is you know what what is it that makes good supervision yep. for families um, for, for sorry for practitioners yep. that are working with families like what is it that makes good that enables practitioners to ensure that the child is not invisible mm -hmm. in their conversations uh, with mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. Do you have any brief mm. reflections around that? Or? We were talking this morning. Mm. We were talking that um, in the place I work with, we have circles, so we have huddles. Huddles of practitioners. Uh, huddles of the the team that I'm working oh, right. in, yeah. where we can go through and go. Um, so what is it? Especially, so we have it on a Friday. So we try to make sure our Fridays are a huddle day. So we are looking after our own well-being, yeah. and we actually go through. So what happened this week? What are you worried about? So you're not taking it home on the weekend. Mm -hmm. So which family are you most worried about? What's stressing you the most? Okay. And as a collective, yep. you know, because oh, right. a lot of brains are better than just one sure. someone holding everything in one person, actually sharing it with the team and going, actually, yep, maybe next week we try mm. this mm. or next mm. week you can do this. So we, we share it mm. and have mm. a group supervision, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is actually quite, um, and a circle, we, we call it circle work, where we meet in a circle and there's something quite ritual in the circle mm. where we all sit in the circle mm. together yeah. as a team, makes yeah. you feel mm. like there's mm. your support. So we talk often mm. talk about parents having hands. So, you know, as a practitioner, it's good to have, to know that there's a set of hands that hold you as well and you're not alone mm. in this space. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I think, um, just that idea, I'll talk about the intentions of what we want to bring, the, qu the practice mm. principles, the qualities we want to bring in when supporting um, children and families. Um, but in supervision, we really need to build in that self-awareness, you know, and mm. kind of the tools that we can use to be aware in the mm -hmm. moment, to then mm -hmm. be more responsive mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and connecting with our clients. I think that that in a way is a big piece for supervision, yeah. mm -hmm. building the theoretical frameworks into what we're learning about the self-reflection on what you're implementing yeah. around that, but then actually what, what we use to help us um, tap into those yeah, things. Because right. stress, you know, it's yeah. it shuts off that, that kind of yep. the thinking brain and I think that's yeah. a big piece of supervision. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, mm. I reckon that could be, well, the topic of a further webinar yeah. discussion actually, <laughs> yep. around Most supervision, uh, around um, child-focused practice. Yep. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Jackie yeah. and Sarah. Yes. Yeah, Thanks really guys. appreciated yep. your reflections and bringing your knowledge and experience and um, yeah. and what's also what stood out to you from um, the parents speaking yeah. earlier yeah. today. So, yeah. And so thank you uh, very much, folks, for joining us uh, for this uh, webcast. We hope there's been some things that have um, uh, sparked off for you, some further reflections around your own practice and in your own context as well. Um, yeah, I'd just like to encourage you if there were um, aspects of today's conversation, either this one or the one earlier, that have um, struck a bit of a chord. Um, there's certainly um, a number of resources that are available on the Emerging Minds website, emergingminds.com.au, which you may well find of interest. Um, the recording of this session will be available in a few days as well for you to um, uh, go back and have another look or tell your friends or whatever. And, um, and also just a reminder to um, please complete the uh, feedback survey. As I mentioned earlier, that helps us uh, get better uh, at what we do as well. So that'd be uh, appreciated. Um, and also that Emerging Minds, together with MHPN, are offering a further webinar uh, next Thursday um, evening around uh, working with parents who have experienced mm. adverse childhood experiences. So um, yeah, we'd love you to uh, join us for that. So thank you very much once again.